Um, we are honored to introduce our guest today, Brother Abdullah Andalusi, who is an Islamic activist thinker and an inspirational thinker uh, and an inspirational speaker. Um, I will allow you to introduce himself, but the topic today is about gender equality and whether Islam promotes gender equality. The talk will be approximately 45 minutes long, uh, followed by a Q&A session, God willing. Um, enjoy the talk. Sean Sweet. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu salam ar-Rahim. Al-Rahim ar-Rahim ar-Rahim. Al-Rahim ar-Rahim ar-Rahim ar-Rahim. I greet you all the Islamic greetings of peace. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. Now the question is, does Islam promote uh, gender equality? And it's a question which uh, has, a, has received quite a lot of attention, uh, quite, quite a lot of interest, and uh, many people. Prom so, all right. <laughs> so many many people are fascinated to see about whether this 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 is this is the case. There's something in Islam which is contrary to gender equality, or is does Islam actually promote it and conducive to it? But I want to ask a more fundamental question, because. A lot of the times, the agenda that is set for us is set by something external to us, by society, by pundits, by uh, media, by uh, politicians. But we have to ask a more fundamental question. Why equality? And not just about gender, but just equality full stop, the actual concept. Why equality? Why, why are we equal? Or how do you justify equality? Let's look at the current pervading political philosophical justifications for it. So they say we're equal, but if you, for which basis do you justify human equality? It used to be based on the idea of natural rights, that we all, uh, nature ordains that we are equal. Does nature ordain that we're equal? Does nature care about equality? If you look at nature, stronger uh, animals, stronger beasts, stronger creatures, devour or show no little sympathy for a lesser or weaker beast if their if their interests are challenged uh, we see this in monkeys we see this in apes we see this in in ants we see this in every almost every animal species there is nature doesn't seem to care about equality if you are stronger more intelligent more resistant to disease uh, more resistant to, to to things like cancer or you age better, you have a natural advantage, you will survive longer, you will uh, have your, your progeny will be most likely to be more, more successful and you'll have more of, of, of progeny than any rival. So nature doesn't really care about equality. What about what other basis can then we derive equality from? Let's say well how maybe we're just equal uh, in, in sharing an attribute of being human. But this is an arbitrary attribute because I could say that we're all equal to the chairs you, we sit on because we share the common attribute of matter and the chair has the same attribute, even organic matter as well, it's made from wood, right? so even organic matter. So why this particular attribute we're singling out and saying we're, we're equal in sharing a, an attribute and the attribute itself isn't, isn't, isn't equal, what would you how would you define even humans would be a, a good discussion. Would you say that a human being is someone that has uh, intelligence? Or what if, the pers if there's a people who don't have intelligence, are they not equal then? Are not, res not deserving of your respect? Some people say that, uh, some uh, liberal philosophers will say that, uh, as a matter of dogma or blind faith, that there is something intrinsic in us which is human, deserves equal respect, and, so, and, ca and is inalienable, cannot be taken away from us regardless. And I say, okay, so let's take one particular right they say we all equally have access to, which is the right to freedom. Right, the right not to be stuck in a cage, in essence. Uh, let's, let's take that example. So, and the, we have this right, why? Because we're human. That's how the argument goes. So then, why are there criminals in prison? Are they not human? Have they ceased being human beings? And if, if their right to freedom is connected to just them being humans, and ceased, they, they haven't ceased to be human, then why lock them in uh, cages and prisons? Uh, surely then it would contradict their 
right to equality, equal treatment to humans who are not locked in cages. So this is the, the current dilemma of secular, uh, mostly Western philosophies to produce any justification for the concept of equality. And many philosophers have noticed this. Louis Poyman, who wrote this, who wrote Are Humans Equal? A Critique of Contemporary Egalitarianism. He said, if we are to accept the empirical reality of people and their differences, there should be a presumption of inequality rather than the presumption of equality upon which so many political philosophers depend. Hunter Baker, a, a, a political scientist, he said, if we are equal, it is almost surely in the sense that we are equal before God because we are equal in virtually no other way. So there is no other justification from a, a secular base or a materialistic basis to say that we're, we're um, equal. The, the Greeks had the concept of isonomia, which is, I suppose, identical before the law. But yet even they, uh, firstly, they had a, their, their way of life was based on their on religious convictions, but even they didn't give the same rights to women and to slaves and non-citizens of, of the Greek state, only free males. And why? Because the Greeks believed that you treat identical things equally. Now, of course, they, they shouldn't, there's no base for them to say that slaves are not equal to free people, free men, but their basis for equality from a materialistic basis was is that with that which is identical should be treated equally. What is not identical cannot be treated equally. And there's no other justification for that. And any, anyone who, who uh, believes in equality is really following an affectation from the Christian past of Europe. But we live in a secular world. We've now lost the ability to justify what pr our predecessors uh, uh, were able to justify based on their religious convictions. And many liberal philosophers have noticed this. They talked about equality and they said, Joe, Fein, uh, Joe Feinberg said, equality is not grounded on anything more ultimate than itself and it is not demonstrably justifiable. Isaiah Berlin said that equality cannot be defended or justified other than by reference to itself. So just, just believe it. You, you can't, there's no justification for it. And of course, Will Kimlicker, another liberal theorist said, the fundamental argument is not to whether to accept equality, but how to interpret it. So really, they don't want to d discuss if it can be justified or not. So then this raises a question as to then why equality? What does equality uh, produce and what are we actually aiming? There must be something greater than equality that we're trying to get at, we're trying to strive for. Now, you might say that, well, perhaps we should treat everyone as having exactly equal, identical rights under the law, rights and privileges and abilities. And this, and this is just a practical, just something practical, let's not talk about the theory, just something practical, that we should implement that. And what you see in some of the uh, kind of re, uh, redresses which are called for in the West, for example, they say that uh, they will have quotas for boards and ensure that women have at least, let's say, 40% quota on uh, managerial boards. But if you were really, uh, if you were really into equality, we would expect to have 40% quotas of women in bomb disposal experts, soldiers, gutter cleaners, miners, and slaughterhouse workers. Why do we not see any calls for 40 to 50% women quotas for those jobs, which are mostly done by men? If you want to talk about equality and redressing imbalances, uh, they've noticed that men uh, live 10% shorter lives than women. Could you say, in the name of equality, that men should now be given 10% more resources than women to uh, redress the natural balance? Because women have 10% more uh, experience of life, when more 10%, you could say 10% more enjoyment of life. So then men should be given 10% more resources to equal out that natural inequality. We get to these kind of absurdities when we try to uh, equal both sides of the equation and we don't but the, the problem is we, we haven't discussed what we are trying to achieve what objective that we're trying to look, look into now I think I want to ask a pertinent question really is are, are men and women identical are they actually identical now in essence in, in, in intelligence you know virtually yes or, or, or if not yes completely I, scientists are, are coming up with different conclusions and things but Generally speaking, there's no evidence to show that men and women in their intelligence are, are different from each other at all whatsoever. There is some debate as to whether 
uh, men can multitask and, and women can uh, focus as much as men. But that's, uh, that's, that's debated by scientists, and I'm not a scientist, so I'm, I'm not going to go into that discussion. But there was in interesting d discussions, like uh, by Lewis Wolpert, who wrote the book, Why Can't a Woman Be More Like a Man? The Evolution of Sex and Gender. But there are some things which are undeniable, which are, are different between men and women. Um, the propensity, obviously, men to be uh, stronger, have more stamina and are faster. Testosterone, rate, the, the rate of testosterone production in men is 20 times more than women per day. If you were to get uh, a blood sample of a man and woman, find that the man would have five times more testosterone than women. Uh, tests have shown that children exposed to greater testosterone, including females, are more likely to be engaged in what we call rough and tumble play, according to um, psychologists who've uh, done, done experiments on this and done observations of this. So testosterone plays a part, surely. And uh, if an alien came to Earth and saw uh, men and women, they, what would the alien conclude as to why men and women look different from each other? What would the alien think? Alien not being subject to our prejudices or our um, uh, dogmas, what would the alien look if it was just analyzing us as creatures? What would they say? What would they look at? Say, why is there a chromosomal difference? What does the chromosomal difference mean? Why is it that men have tendency to have more greater upper body strength, 10% more stamina? Um, what you know? Why don't we see sports um, where men and women can compete in the same in the same uh, sport? So for weightlifting or for boxing or for wrestling or for uh, sprinting? Why you have gender segregation uh, in sports? And, and you know you won't see any of the of the the Daily Mail or the or the Tory Party couldn't start having going out being outraged at segregation at sports. Of course, it only applies to Muslims in university events sometimes. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, so so why is that then? Uh, this is really the obvious. So what does it what does it mean? You know, what does it mean? The hormone hormonal difference. Again, I'll leave this more to, to scientists who are uh, you know investigating. Uh, and looking at the evidence, but there is clear behavioural differences because in mother, because of uh, testosterone. I mean, there's more men in prison than women by by far. I think it's 80 to 90 percent uh, is men in prison, uh, not women. Why is that? Is that just nurture? Is this something about our acculturation? Uh, it has to be something based in some aspect of why there. You know, women have two X chromosomes and we have an XY chromosome. There has to be a better explanation. So then, now I've discussed that men and women are not identical, but we are talking about equality and I wanted to ask the question, what does equality, what should it aim for? What, we actually, what higher value than equality are we trying to achieve and how can we uh, justify it? Well, as uh, the Swiss philosopher Henri Frédéric Emiel said, liberty, equality are bad principles. The only true principle for humanity is justice and justice to the feeble is protection and kindness. And what the Quran says uh, regarding the whole purpose of revelation of messengers coming down to mankind uh, is, is, is elaborated in this verse of Quran. We believe God says, we sent our messengers with clear signs and sent down with them the book and the, and the measure or the balance in order to establish justice amongst the people. So the, the higher ideal is justice. And justice is giving people uh, what they need, what they deserve. This is what Islam does. So in Islam, if criminals are punished and other people are not punished, other people who are not criminals are not punished, uh, we don't say uh, this is an inequality with treating people who are both human. We say the criminals who commit an act of crime deserve the punishment and those who didn't do not deserve that. And this is where justice um, uh, it would be cons more consistent than merely saying um, equality. Now, how does it's, uh, the uh, Quran talk about the value of men and women in the eyes of God. Well, the Quran says very clearly in Surah Al-Imran, it says, uh, God is saying, I do not waste the deed of any doer among you, any male or female. The one of you is as the other. So in the eyes of God, men and women are intrinsically or essentially equal in the eyes of God. But we also, uh, we also see this also, also in regards to race. So we see the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, O oh people, your God is one, uh, your father is one, referring to Adam salam. No preference of, of an Arab neither over a non-Arab, nor of a non-Arab over an Arab, or red over black, or black over red, except for the most righteous. Verily, the most honored of you is the most righteous. 
So you, we all start out fundamentally equal, but those who rise up in ranks over others is based purely on your morality, on your virtue, how you choose to be, how you choose to act will raise your, your rank. And the great thing about that is, is we all have equal access uh, to uh, equal capability to uh, be righteous or not righteous. But we notice that the Quran also talks about just the condition of humans where uh, God says that he raises some humans up in ranks and, 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 and uh, he gives to some and doesn't give to others and to test those of what he's given. So people who are, there are people who are rich in society and there are people who are poor in society. Should we remove, if we want to be truly you know, egalitarians or absolute egalitarians, we should take the money from the rich to, and to equalize it with the poor and become communists. Would that be a, a good solution? No, and that, that was, ex experiment was tried for 70 years and failed catastrophically with the Soviet Union. However, what Islam views uh, the purpose of why there are people who are rich or people who are more healthier than others, our understanding of this is not that God is capricious or he's unjust. But what the Quran says is that when God gives something to some people, some either a blessing of some kind, equal to that or commensurate to that, there is an equal responsibility that goes along with it. So a rich person on the day of judgment will have to account for what they did with their money and, and did they spend it on the poor? Did they help people with what they were given? And it will be harder for a rich person to get into paradise than a poor person because they have more things they have to be accountable for. And so ultimately, if you're given something, you're also given a commensurate amount of responsibility alongside it. And that, as in Islam, we call equality, ultimately. I'll just give examples. So, we're not allowed to carry around, let's say, guns in a society. In London, in England, we're not. In America, you are. But uh, in England, you're not allowed to carry around guns. So if you were to see a policeman on the streets carrying around a pistol or a gun, as, as, as we see in some, some, um, in some places around London, I don't know about Leicester, but you, you probably saw, saw what, a few of them at some point, would we say, that's not fair? How comes they get to carry around guns and we don't get to carry around guns? That's not fair. Why do they get that privilege? But we wouldn't say it was a privilege. Why? Because we expect the police to put their lives on the line lest uh, uh, some criminal comes out and they have to stop that criminal and protect the rest of society. So they're given the, uh, uh, the ability to carry the gun, but at the same time they have to put their life on the line to protect those who don't have guns. So we're not saying, so no one will ever say the police are, are give, or there's an inequality between the police and the general public because alongside the police's, police's uh, 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 privileges, they also have a commensurate amount of responsibilities that we don't have. Uh, that that uh, commensurate amount of responsibilities. And this is what Islam considers to be equality, uh, overall equality. But first, I want to talk about, uh, uh, and it's a very big misconception, obviously, is what are the rights of women in Islam? Because this is what this, is, this topic is related to. No one came in to, to this lecture uh, thinking, uh, I've heard so many bad things about you know, men not having enough rights in Islam compared to women, so I want to see what this topic is going to answer. No one actually, no one ever, no one, uh, probably no one thought that, unless you're a men's rights activist. So, let me, uh, let me describe a, a bit more about what Islam gives uh, women and their rights to defeat some misconceptions, because my, currently I want to, I want to try, to, try to contextualize what I've said. So what rights do women gave? And these are rights, most of these rights women never had prior to Islam, especially in the Arabian uh, Peninsula. So unlike what happened in, in the West and up until um, I think just last century, where they had this concept called couverture, which was basically uh, women couldn't own property, their husbands owned their property and were even uh, legally liable for them. So women were deprived of, um, a cent or of their own responsibilities towards their own property. And so, and sometimes a rich woman, men would like to marry, marry her in English culture, for example, because they would take her property and be, able, be the executives of it and owners of it and disposers uh, of the property. In Islam, uh, women have the right to own their own property of which no one can touch the property. So they keep their property. When they get married, they keep their name. Uh, their husband has no right to their property what, uh, to whatsoever. They have rights from their husband which the husband has to provide. There's no choice on the matter. 
the, the husband must provide financial support to the woman in, uh, during the marriage. She does not have to spend a single penny on her husband. Even if she is rich and he is poor, the obligation is for a, a man to, um, to look after the, the wife financially, so she doesn't have to pay any money out of her own pocket. In marriage, she's given a, a marriage gift or dowry, according to an English translation of that, which is usually can be a considerable amount, uh, sum of money. If divorced, the, the man must pay um, alimony to the wife and ensure that she is kept um, off the street and, and not penniless or made into a vagrant. The, pro the women have the right to vote in Islam. Now, what I mean by voting is uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. In, in Islamic leadership, a, a discourse, the leader can only be the leader once the people give the, the leader the Pledge of Allegiance. So the people um, legitimate the leader. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who was the first leader of the Muslim community, uh, he requested the Pledge of Allegiance from both men and women. So we didn't need to have uh, a suffra uh, suffragettes just, or suffragette and suffragettes uh, movements. We didn't need to have a, a dawdling over whether women can have equal um, you know, political participation uh, to uh, select the leader uh, and wait uh, a thousand years up until only just last century for women to get the vote. 1,400 years ago, uh, women were given uh, equal access and equal uh, uh, responsibility to legitimate uh, the leader of the, the, the Muslim uh, world. We also see that women have the right to work and own their own business. The Prophet wife, wife's Hadija Radila and her, she was a successful businesswoman. In fact, she actually employed uh, Prophet Muhammad uh, so he, that was, uh, that, that was, her, was um, his boss. And women have a right to education. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that you know, seeking knowledge is an obligation on men and women. Uh, there was a case where some women complained to the Prophet Muhammad that, because, that uh, when they were trying to attend, to listen to him, uh, some men were crowding around the front of him and they couldn't have access uh, to him to ask him questions and, and learn from him. And so he, he um, gave women only days where women can have direct uh, access and without being disturbed by some uh, rambunctious males. <laughs> Uh, we see that women have the right in Islam not to be abused uh, physically uh, or emotionally. One of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said to ask the Prophet, what do you command us? What do you say to, uh, with, to us uh, with regards to how we should treat our wives? And he replied, give them food from what you have for yourself, clothe them by which you clothe yourself, and do not beat them and do not insult them. In another um, narration, because do not, do not even uh, do not impute ugliness to their face. Uh, so we see that in Islam, women can't be insulted, they can't be degraded, and they can't be uh, certainly can't be beaten. I would dare argue that uh, women don't have the right not to be insulted in in, in Western culture. In in the marriage, um, many husbands and wives will can insult and abuse each other. Uh, and it's not necessarily falls foul of the law, although people are now discussing about what is you know, verbal domestic abuse being possibly not a form of domestic abuse. That's still being discussed. But we say that it is wrong for, the, for even the first insult to be uttered from the mouth. That is wrong, for, for, and we stop it, it, we nip it in the bud. So women has the, a woman has a right not uh, to be insulted and to be protected from uh, uh, verbal abuse as well as physical abuse. Women have the right to choose who she marries in Islam. So we see there was, a, there was a case where the Prophet Muhammad was approached by a woman who said that her father had uh, coerced her into marrying a, a gentleman. And so the Prophet said, well, do you want me to dissolve the marriage? And she said, uh, no, I actually quite like him, but it's for the principle. <laughs> so, uh, and many other narrations that, that reiterate the same. In Islam, women have the right to her husband's time, affection, and sexual satisfaction by law. So, uh, uh, so a husband can't abscond or neglect his wife. Um, in, in the West, uh, under uh, the law system, which is based on individualism, where you're all individuals, uh, you can do what you want. You don't have to have any responsibilities to your wife if you're a guy. You can go out with your mates, you can ignore her, uh, you can come home, not even speak to her. And that seems to be, that's not against the law, that's not wrong, apparently, uh, in, uh, in uh, the Western legal system. But in Islam, uh, the woman can take her husband to court and demand those rights. Because the, she, she, that, that, this is the thing though, Islam understands that we're human beings. Human beings need things from each other. 
We are social creatures. We're not individuals or autonomous islands that, that don't have any interaction with anyone else, and we're just happy when we're by ourselves. Uh, if, that's, if that's the case, go live in a desert island and, uh, and see if, if you, how happy you'll be with no humans around you. Right? As human beings, we need reciprocal relationships with each other. So Islam isn't individualist or believes in autonomy because humans are not autonomous, full stop, even by nature. If no one taught you how to, how to even um, speak a language, you would never develop it spontaneously. And uh, right now, there's, amongst um, anthropologists and sociologists, they're still wondering how language first came about because humans don't seem to be able to generate it. They, ne they have to be taught it and they can't generate it spontaneously. This is, this is still a big discussion. So uh, women have the right to, obviously, dignity and respect. And if the husband is negligent in any, other of, his, or any of his obligations, if he is rebellious to his obligations towards her, he can take her to court. So, so she can take um, him to court and, and he can get punished. So this is the rights that women have in Islam, which I dare say don't exist to the full extent in the Western legal system. Uh, so uh, this, is what, this is what we consider to be um, rights. Now, uh, I suppose if, if a men's rights activist guy was here in the audience, or girl, there are, there are women in men's rights activists too, they'd probably argue now that uh, Islam is, is, is against men's sexual autonomy because it forces men to, to uh, satisfy the needs of their wife. But because for them, it's a, uh, them and feminists, they're, they're opposite number, they are individualists. And so individuals, they believe, should not be compelled to do anything. They, or they exist for themselves. In Islam, we believe that we exist for, for God. And in doing so, we exist to serve each other. Uh, because we're not, we're a species. We're not, just, we're not just an individual. Now, Islamic society throughout history um, saw uh, great women businessmen, uh, great women leaders, great women uh, scholars, jurisprudence. The first universe, the modern university, as we'd understand it, was actually set up by a wealthy female businesswoman in Morocco, in modern-day Morocco, uh, you know, a thousand years ago. We see that uh, a, the scholar Sheikh Akram Nadari, who looked through historical documents, and he, he found, he found 8,000 female uh, scholars from the early times of Islam who were, these were Islamic scholars, jurisprudence, 8,000. The reason why he kept it, he said he stopped it at 8,000 because it was just too much. And so he just had to, and you know, he had to publish his book by a deadline. So he kept it at 8,000 and uh, didn't continue doc uh, documenting, but he documented 8,000 scholars before he had to stop and so on. So in Islam, we don't see that women have a deficiency of intellect at all. Uh, women, there was in the time of Caliph Omar, Caliph Omar was a companion of, of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and then succeeded him in leadership. Um, after, after Abu Bakr uh, as the head of, head of the Muslim world and he had an advisor, a political advisor advising him on political strategy and with dealing with people's needs and, that was, and it was a woman. He also employed uh, a street judge, uh, not to be confused with Judge Dredd, the Islamic concept of a uh, street judge, uh, but a street judge who would go to marketplaces and ensure um, that people weren't cheating each other, weren't uh, being deceptive and the street judge was a woman. So Caliph Omar, and this, this, is, this is all in 7th century, right? this is not you know, last century, or this is 7th century, we had women being judges, women being scholars. Some of the greatest Islamic uh, scholars from history, like Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, even Imam Bukhari, were all students at one point in time of female scholars. So they were students learning from women scholars. So we didn't have this rule that, we didn't, we, first of all, we don't have a clergy, and secondly, we don't have a clergy and we don't have a restriction on women uh, fr from attaining um, uh, positions or teaching about Islamic knowledge. In fact, it, it, it's 40% of um, narrations about the Prophet Muhammad's life in Sunni narrations are narrated by a woman, which is uh, Aisha, anha, which was um, one of the Prophet's wives. So in Islam, uh, women can work. Women, can, women actually can even join the army voluntarily, obviously for men, uh, being a reservist is obligatory in Islam, but for women they can voluntarily join, join the army. Uh, we saw women who were voluntarily joining um, naval forces. Uh, women can be, I said, positions of, of, of political uh, consultation, judges, scholars. So in Islam, we didn't have the, any restriction on women education, women entrepreneurship. But I, I would say more importantly, Gender just really wasn't an issue. 
uh, in, in the West, we're so fixated by gender, we, we group people into so many different categories. We even have categories of, for race, the black community and the, the white community, as if the colour of your skin somehow affects your culture. Or even sexual preference, where they say that, that this is the gay community. I say, how does your sexual preference uh, create an entire culture? You know, we, we categorise humans into these groups, and we, say, we, have to, we, we try to say this group has to have also bits of power of this or that. In Islam, it was irrelevant. We transcended this group, groupism or, or identification uh, groups uh, or identification politics, which is um, commonplace this day. And it didn't matter. If you were a scholar and you, you met the grade, you were a scholar, irregardless, regardless of your, your skin color, regardless of your gender, it was just irrelevant. Uh, they didn't, didn't even consider it. No one complained that Omar had a, a female street judge or a um, a female who was advising him. No one, no one cared. It was not as long as she was doing her job. It was not an issue. So we completely transcended sexism. And this is actually a, a problem which happened in the West. Now, but where there are differences or functional considerations is is actually just related to the private sphere, not the public sphere. And the private sphere is uh, the family, the fundamental unit of society in the, in the Muslim um, political philosophy is family, not individuals and not the community. Communists will say the, the society is the fundamental unit of society. Uh, it, it, liberalism, or political individualism, if you want to call it like that, b believes individuals are the fundamental unit of society. But in Islam, we consider it to be the family is the fundamental unit of society. The family gave birth to you. An individual, uh, you didn't give birth to yourself as individuals. You came from families. Your families nurtured you. It's the first support mechanism that most of us had. Um, and uh, it's, it's what, what taught us language, what taught us morals, and uh, what, what nurtured us. It's the family. So then, really, what Islam tries to do is it takes the differences between men and women and tries to produce a uh, symbiotic relationship to create a fa a, an efficient family structure, which is fair uh, to all and involves reciprocal relationships because I said we, we're social creatures we're not uh, aut um, you know, autonomous individuals uh, um, as uh, liberalism would have it so what does the Quran say uh, about this the matter of the family well first and foremost the Quran says that men are the protectors and maintainers of women because God has made uh, one of them to excel the other so people, people translate that as maybe like physical strength and, and, uh, and so on and because they spend uh, to support them from their means so uh, men support and maintain women and protect uh, women. There must be some reason why uh, men are physically stronger than women, uh, why nature, evolution, if you believe, or any, whatever you want to believe, why uh, uh, the basis for made men different to, to women. And in Islam, it's interesting, people say that uh, you know, uh, the, the, the foremost consideration in Islam uh, must be men and women are just tagalongs, but this is not how the Quran describes it. If anything, the Quran describes the purpose of men to revolve around women, not all the way around. So our job as, as men in the family is just to be the protector and maintainer of women. So we are the ones which revolve around the nucleus, and the nucleus is, uh, is, is the woman of the, uh, in the family. And the Quran continues. It says, and, uh, and women shall have rights similar to the rights uh, against them according to what is equitable. Uh, but men will have a degree of responsibility uh, over them. So, what, how Islam organizes the family is that it aims to protect uh, women, it aims to see that they are maintained and they don't have to worry about where their next meal is coming from or to feel vulnerable or to feel uh, exposed. So this is how Islam uh, tries to uh, organize the family relationship and it's actually done to honor the woman not done to, not because she is somehow weak or incapable and so on. It's not how Islam looks at the matter. First and foremost, the Islamic perspective of the woman within the family context is actually uh, gives her more respect than the father. So according to a narration of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when a man come up, came up to him and asked him, he said, Oh Prophet of God, uh, should I, he asked, should I respect, um, who should I respect, my father or my mother? You know, who should I respect more, my, my father or my mother? So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, your mother, and then, goes, oh, so, and then my father, and then he said again, no, your mother again. And then he asked, and then my father? No, mother again. Three times. And then he said father. So the mother is respected three times more than the father because her position in, in the family is so key. It's so important. Um, she gives birth to the, the future of mankind. I don't, that's not something which is uh, uh, worthless or, me or meaningless like 
some modern day uh, feminist advocates like to portray, uh, not all feminist advocates, but some modern day uh, feminist advocates like to portray that women having a motherly role is somehow diminutive. That if only a woman, a woman can only have value if she contributes economically to society. And that's a very materialistic way of looking at human worth. So a woman's worth is only how much she can contribute economically to society. That's very materialistic. So the, uh, the, 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 the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam's teachings gave women three times more respect the, uh, than the, the, the father in a society, in the family. The, also the Quran commanded men to live with women on a footing of kindness and equity. And it also says if you dislike uh, something in them, it may be that you dislike a thing which God brings about it through a great deal of good. So he even tells men not to be judgmental on women and not to nitpick or find fault. He said, if you find something you think is a fault, maybe God has put, uh, has put that there and will give you a source of goodness. Maybe there's a hidden good in that. So don't judge women, don't uh, find fault or complain about them. So value uh, women. Islam respects women so much that it, it tries to protect them from being viewed as sexual objects. If you actually want to see how a society values life, see how a society values the source of human life, women. So we see that in capitalism where everyone, everything is a, is a commodity, women, and feminists complain about this, uh, that women are made into sexual objects to sell products, that they are because they've become one-dimensional creatures uh, related to their beauty and their physical appearance. They're judged by their physical appearance. Women don't feel are made to feel by society now that uh, inadequate or um, uh, invisible if they don't put up makeup or don't show uh, the most uh, 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 um, a beautiful face they can put on and beautiful um, appearance they can put on. They look. They they feel like they don't. The people won't give them attention. They won't attain. Uh, any position of power or, or have anyone's time or even um, get, get married to Mr. Right. So this is how society, and this is what some feminists have complained about, about, about modern society, Western society rather. This is the situation that's been created. But what Islam did is um, when it ordained protections like the hijab and uh, the niqab, now first and foremost, um, Islam aims to remove sexual politics from society, from both men and women. Uh, most men are not allowed to show body shape and we're not allowed to expose below the, from the navel to the knee. So um, any, any uh, guys here who go to gym and, and somehow coincidentally just like to, like, like to wear very tight fitting clothing, uh, pay attention to that, you're not allowed to do that if you're Muslim. So as, as, as uh, uh, Islam, it protects both men and women from sexual objectification. And it's not, people uh, say that, oh, is it because you're going to get, you, you think they're going to get raped, or you're protecting them from rape? I said, it's got no, we don't, nothing to do with the issue of rape. The issue is the dignity of humans. That is the fundamental issue first. First and foremost, forget about rape. Even if there were zero rapes in any society, the fundamental issue is the dignity of human beings. That's what has to be protected, both men and both women. The, the, uh, the, the head covering and the, uh, the jidbab or the, the body covering is the purpose of, of it is actually a woman's passport into the world. It's her passport, it's her ability to go outside and pursue uh, what she wants professionally, uh, you know, uh, educationally, uh, in a respectful manner without being accosted or viewed in a certain way or judged on her appearance at all whatsoever. We remove the issue of appearance from society and instead replace it with only valuing what people, with the content of people's hearts and the content of their characters. That's the purpose of, of hijab. You also see that um, the, the, in, in Western society, when, the, when you see obviously uh, women um, on the streets who are, are, not, are, are being told by fashion magazines and pressured by billboards and adverts to look a certain way, that this causes a lot of trouble just between women. So women become uh, envious or jealous of each other by, they judge her by looks themselves. So women will judge themselves by looks, judge each other by looks. So now that women are, are actually now degrade them, have uh, are, are, are robbed of dignity even from how they look uh, between themselves. And, it, and, the, and the problem has also got, got to, the, uh, to the point where um, even uh, if, uh, if a, a woman is married to a husband or, or in this society a boyfriend, sometimes she feels insecure that there are other women who are obviously very attractive and are dis displaying that attraction in society and you know, that her husband or her boyfriend's eyes might stray. And now even vice versa with men being, being you know, uh, as well. 
is that is that a society whereby you know humans can live cohesively, uh, can live in a sense of peace and tranqu tranquility when we're all competing with each other to outdo each other? to be more attractive than each other, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, attract attention away from people, other, other people's spouses. This is not uh, conducive to, I just think, any kind of peaceful or enlightened society. That's the, that's the point. So Islam tries to dignify humans by removing uh, these uh, social compulsions for beauty. And what we've seen is we've seen that in the West there are some very uh, horrific practices which are done, which are now uh, are totally legal. You know when they bring up the issue of um, a female genital mutilation, which uh, in Islam is not an Islamic practice whatsoever. It's, it's a traditional practice in many parts of the world. Many of these parts of the world are not, not Muslim at all. It's just practiced in, in that area of the world for centuries. But uh, the, when they raise the issue of female genital mutilation, I, I often wondered why they called they, um, the issue they called it was female genital mutilation. Because in the West you can undergo, and women uh, are increasingly doing so, going to cosmetic surgeons and undertaking labiaplasties, which by the very definition is mutilation of the female genitalia. But they say, oh, that's okay, because it's consensual. Okay, then, so maybe you should then read, describe the problem of FGM as non-consensual female genital mutilation. Don't just say female genital because you seem to be okay with, with FGM if it's done by the consent of the woman in a, in a plastic surgery somewhere uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the city. So, so, the, so they don't have a problem with FGM as long as it's consensual. So the issue really is consent. Whereas in Islam, we don't believe that um, uh, that uh, uh, people should have to mutilate themselves to look attractive or look beautiful. We don't believe that, and we and we try to eliminate social compulsion for for women to look a certain way, uh, like airbrushed models in in a, in a picture, such as you know, women are forced now in some cases they feel they have the need to be anorexic, bulimia is on the rise. Uh, we see that people inject collagen or Botox, which I believe is derived from botulism, which is some kind of, uh, <laughs> which is very nasty if you think about it. What just to get the inflammation of the of the lips? Uh, I, feel, I, I view these as mutilations of women, of the women, of women, and it was mutilations induced by social pressure and social compulsion. I think that's a kind of oppression on women. I think that's a kind of uh, forcing them uh, to look a certain way in order to get um, some kind of uh, attention or uh, elevation in that society. So. The hijab and, and jilbab is actually there to liberate women from these social, these very negative social forces and eliminate um, sexual tension from society, sexual politics from society. Because you don't go out into society uh, for intercourse or sex, you go out into society to work, to study. You don't go out, you know, uh, sexual intercourse happens in the privacy of your own home. So why are we bringing um, sexual politics out into the wider society? Now. Uh, people might say that, well, um, why is it that women have to cover more of their body than men? This is an argument they bring, saying, isn't this an inequality? Is this unfair? But the argument, very simple, is that, uh, anatomically speaking, obviously there's, there's more, uh, women have more uh, anatomically related, uh, related uh, uh, reproductive um, you know, uh, matters upon them well, as compared to men, which is, that, that's just that's the nature of it. But what you'll also find in, um, even in Western systems, they also give differential rights based on biology as well. I'll give you one example. So one example I like to cite is, this, it is said that uh, men and women have equal reproductive rights. And what you'll find with many um, uh, feminist advocates is they'll, they'll talk about women's rights, reproductive rights. And usually the right to abortion, they, they, they say, right to abortion. So they have reproductive rights. The right to abort their fetus or to see it to term. But a simple question, do, 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 men, does men, do men have equal reproductive rights to women? Do we believe in equality in this matter? And they'll say, okay, yes, yes, they do. Okay, so if uh, a man, uh, obviously, he has intercourse with a woman, she's pregnant, he wants to see his fetus to term, she doesn't want to see the fetus to term, she wants to abort it, will the man's rights, equal rights to reproduction, be respected or have any say in the matter? No. So whether she wants to terminate or see it to term, he'll have no say in it. And if she wants to see it to term against his will, uh, then he'll be forced to pay child support uh, by law, even though he had no say in the matter. Does that sound like equal reproductive rights between men and women? Of course, people will say, ah, but women have to carry the child or carry the, the fetus. I say, oh, oh, okay, fine. So you're saying that different biology, biological circumstances causes different rights. And so, in principle, they also agree 
that different, the, the biological differences necessitate different rights. So, uh, and so, so the print, they, don't, they don't disagree with the principle, it's just now how, where we put these, these barriers. Of course, in Islam, uh, we don't believe in, um, uh, obviously, abortion, and we believe, obviously, sex must be uh, within marriage. Reason being is marriage offers the protections to women and protections to men and the protections to children uh, as well. And the, ma the man can't abscond. In an individual society, the man can abscond. He doesn't, have to, he, has, he doesn't have to take care of the woman. He can just walk away with no other obligations towards her or her children, and she'll be left literally holding the baby. So, how Islam, to, to kind of to, to round up, how Islam deals with the issues between men and women is not one where they say we must have exact identical equality, uh, and that's how to bring justice. Because we see that identical equality uh, doesn't bring uh, justice because men and women are, are different and they're going to have different matters as even in the West uh, we're giving differential reproductive rights even they uh, have to concede so what Islam aims to do is to create equal justice for both depending on their needs and their uh, and their circumstances um, someone someone mentioned they said you say that a man is responsible for a woman but what if a woman is richer she's more dominant than her husband and she wants to be uh, the one in charge, and she wants to be the one who uh, takes care of her husband. Well, the great thing about Islam is that the exceptions usually resolve themselves. Because if she was marrying an alpha male, let's just say, and they would just argue and bicker as to who, uh, you know, as to, as to who, who decides what in the family, and who, who looks after who in the family. But naturally, uh, a, a woman who's naturally very dominant would probably marry a, woman, a man who's, very, uh, who's not so dominant, and so what you'll get in Islam is that as long as uh, the man and the woman uh, consent amongst each other to an arrangement, then that could be acceptable. So as long as there's consent on both sides. So for example, a woman can choose not to insist her husband support her voluntarily. She can voluntarily decide not to request her right from her husband to financially support her if she's rich or, whatever, or what have you. And that will be the case. Um, the husband you know, won't be punished if he stays at home and looks after the kids and the woman goes out to work as long as it's consensual between the two of them. So the exceptions usually resolve themselves, but the, the uh, guided framework is for people who want to have a, what is now called a traditional marriage, whereby they want to be uh, looked after by their husband, they want to be uh, uh, protected, and they want to ensure that their, um, their husband gives them the needs that they uh, deserve as, as human beings. And so this, this the standard marriage is, is given as, uh, not just a guideline as well, but as a, as a, a fundamental protection. And, and how Islam, why Islam, so why Islam never, we never faced this problem, the battle of the sexes, which you saw in the last century and probably still ongoing. If you listen to the, the discussions between the MRAs and the feminists, the battle of the sexes, where everyone's now fighting each other for their the needs, and they're fighting each other. And the problem is, of course, that in, under individualism, no one has obligations towards each other. All right, so how do we resolve this when what you're fighting for, you're actually fighting for how to, for being, to be treated in a nice way? But all the law looks, looks at is not to treat each other in a bad way, but you don't have to treat each other nicely. There's no obligation. What Islam did is it removed the power from the men, it removed the power from the women, and gave it to God, and gave it to the Islam. And Islam gives justice to both men and women. So what is, there is not, there is not no, there isn't any uh, one group over another but rather there is both groups cooperating with each other for a greater good which is more important and sovereign than any other uh, group's uh, 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 interests and ideas. And what we see, what the Quran says, it says that the believers, men and women, are friends one of the other. They enjoin what is right and they forbid what is wrong and they establish worship and pay charity and they obey God and his messenger and for these God will have mercy on them. And this is how Islam uh, brings justice to both by ensuring that both submit to justice. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that amazing talk. We hope that's clarified a few points. Um, we will open the floor for Q&A if that's okay. If you don't want to ask out loud, there should be a paper going around with some uh, questions you can write down there. Okay. Um, questions, comments, or, or criticisms. I also welcome um, criticisms. So please, if you have, if I've said something that strongly outraged you, please uh, feel free to, to voice it, and we can have a discussion. I'll let you come back. 
Uh, you, sister. Um, yeah, I, I found that very interesting. I didn't obviously, I didn't agree with everything you said, but I understand the justifications. And a lot of where Islam is where the position of justice that you're talking about comes from. But one of the things I don't think you spoke about was the things that a lot of people pick up on is the fact of Muhammad uh, having so many wives and the uh, fact that in Islam is there, uh, is it allowed to have any wives? Um, what do you think this uh, says about gender equality in Islam? So, uh, just to reiterate, so you're saying that. Why did the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, have many wives and how does this relate to gender equality? How did that relate to gender equality, just out of curious? What, what, what would be your...? No, I mean, is, is there an equivalent right for females to have many husbands? Is this a, a, is this a case of if the women consent to um, being one of many wives, what does this say about the position and value of women? Um, okay. Well, well, first and foremost, just, just look at the context of polygamy. So yes, it's, Islam does permit um, polygamy. It doesn't command polygamy. That's, there's a difference. It doesn't say, you know, thou shalt, thou shalt have uh, many wives. It's, it, it's actually an exception. Why? Because um, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, the, the pagan Arab culture, um, men could take any number of wives they want and give no rights to any of those women. I mean, there was no women's rights or rights uh, or, or for women against their husbands. And so um, it was a very anarchic uh, uh, system. It was a very unfair system. Um, uh, it, you know, women's um, kind of needs were not looked at by the pagan um, Arab culture. So what the Quran did is actually it, it put a cap on the number of wives people can take. It says, well, ma absolute maximum is four, if you can treat them equally. And believe me, if you read the later verse, it says that people, you know, that men would never be able to treat all their wives absolutely equally. But you have to treat them equal. Uh, you know, you have to have separate houses, you have to give, spend equal time. Uh, what you give to one, you have to give to the, the others, which is virtually uh, nigh on impossible for most men. 99.999% of men. But there are some men who feel they are able to, um, are able to, and want to engage in that. And so that is to regulate, rather than just abolish, rather than just having a blanket abolition. For those uh, men that do so, uh, there is, uh, there is the, the permissibility of it. Now. There are three arguments I put for the, the, the issue of polygamy and why we don't see polyandry uh, in Islam, so multiple husbands for the, for the wife. First and foremost, I could, I could quote a scientific uh, uh, kind of observation. This is just an observation, really. Um, biologists and zoologists have noticed um, a study, in the study of um, sexual dimorphism that the more, di the more different the male is to any, any of, the, uh, of the female in any species, the more likely that species is, is to be polygamous. So a case of a swan, the male and the female swan look virtually identical, um, general then monogamous. But let's say uh, with, uh, with, with chickens, you have hens and cockerels, obviously it's polygamy. Uh, you'll see with um, uh, various apes and, uh, and monkeys and so on and so forth, there's, you know, there's uh, baboons and so on, there's, there's polygamy. So we see that uh, this is what has been noticed. So, and where they've, and they, then they tried to look at humans and say, well, well what would, Based on our, our theory of, of sexual dimorphism being a predictor, a predictor of polygamy, humans are somewhere in between monogamy and polygamy. This is, what they, this is what they generally say on the matter. But just because scientists say it doesn't mean that's, the, uh, that's a value in of itself. It's just an interesting observation. I just put it out there. But there are two uh, reasons why Islam allows, uh, a, uh, allows polygamy, or rather the regulation of it, for the 0.0001% of males, and doesn't allow a polyandry. The first point is, that in Islam, the male is uh, responsible for and the protector and provider of uh, the female in the family unit. So if you were to have more than one, if a woman was to have more than one husband, uh, there'd, be, uh, there'd be basically two people who are responsible for the same person and they'd be fighting and jostling and, and so on because they both ha are meant to have responsibility of the same person and there'll be arguments and, and, and disputes. The second argument is actually um, it's biological differences. One man may uh, impregnate four women you know, at the same time. Well, not at the same time, but, um, but in, uh, in generally speaking, let's say within a week, he can, he can have all four of his wives pregnant. Uh, but a, a, woman, a woman only has one womb, so if she has four husbands, do each of those husbands have an equal chance or right to have their offspring with the, with the, with the wife? 
Uh, maybe one husband's more virile than the other husband, or the, you know, the, their gametes are stronger, and one husband's progeny will predominate over another. So all the husbands won't have an equal, equal right or to have equal chance to have their progeny. Whereas uh, what they've seen with a man that has multiple wives is that uh, they produce really large, large, large families. It doesn't seem to inhibit uh, the, women's, uh, 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 the women's chances to get pregnant but just because she's sharing the same man. Whereas it will certainly inhibit a man's chances to have his offspring if he has to share that one womb with other, other men. So biological differences, would, I would say, uh, would seem to be, uh, would necessitate differences in that matter. So that would be the argument uh, why Islam uh, prohibits, would prohibit polyandry but not uh, polygamy. And polygamy is only is regulated, not encouraged in Islam. But as for the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, uh, having multiple wives, which is what you mentioned originally, um, well, if you actually saw, uh, many of these women were widows and were very, very old women. Uh, and he married them. A lot of them were, were, the, were the, connected to the heads of tribes. And the Prophet Muhammad would marry, uh, marry a, a woman of a, of a, of a noble in a, in a, in a, into a tribe to unite the tribe with him. So much like how, I suppose, um, how everyone really kind of back, back then would mar intermarry to, to create unity. But he would intermarry uh, these women who were, these weren't, uh, you know, very young, very young women or so on. These were, you know, most of them were war widows uh, and they were generally very um, 30s, 40s and so on, so sometimes 50s. So it wasn't for any kind of um, uh, physical, physical desire. I'm going I'm to marry many women just to have a, a harem of young uh, Vera women. No, it was actually to create unity between the tribes. So that would be uh, the cause of why the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had uh, well, more than four wives in that, in that case. Any other questions, comments, or, or criticisms? You, sister. You just mentioned his hijab, but you didn't explain what hijab exactly. And I think because now it's a very debatable uh, topic or what's, what's the hijab and uh, as well. The jilba, the, 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 the Okay, well, the but the precise form of the clothing can, can vary depending on, on on the culture of any of any people who are Muslim, but rather the clothing has to achieve, achieve two objectives, which um, are, are not really debated amongst um, classical scholars, amongst the companions of the Prophet, or even in the narration of the Prophet Muhammad himself or the Quran. And really, it is that uh, the the head is covered, the bosom is covered, and the, sh the body shape is covered. Well, um, okay, well, 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 yes, there is the verse dealing with, sorry? And he, uh, and, and very specific, there, there's mentioned in Quran specifically. That well, yes, uh, when it says, you know, to, to, to uh, draw the, the, uh, the head covering, the himar over the, the, over the bosoms, there's the head covering and to cover, use that to cover the bosoms, was mentioned in the, in the verse of the Quran. So it is mentioned, and the head, sorry? Uh, I don't think means. No, there's another verse. That says the I think I believe the Arabic word is the the himar on the, the head covering, which means head covering, and draw it over the bosoms. They have to put scarf on their. No, so to, to, to draw it over. The, the command says to draw. So they were having a head covering and to draw it over the bosoms as well. That's what the verse of the Quran says. So it's the head covering, and to and, and it was actually command to actually draw it because some of them, some women were wearing head covering, but they were leaving their. You obviously is there any, any, exposed. Any word means head or hair? Head covering, yeah, the word that the word meaning head, yeah, means head covering. Any Arabs want to, any Arabic speakers want to contradict me on that? If you feel feel free, or to <laughs> come back and say that's not the meaning of the word, so I, I accept that. But that's, that's as far as I can tell, that's what the meaning also. But but the, the thing is this is that um, but there's there's a fundamental issue behind that question. Um, first and foremost, I'm, I'm not we in Islam we don't believe that if a woman doesn't uh, cover her hair that she's naturally. She must be a woman of ill repute. All we don't we don't view it like that, right? So we're not. This is not the Islamic understanding. Unfortunately, that can be some of the traditional cultural understandings in many of the Muslim world. But we believe it is commanded in Islam for the elevation of women in society and to allow them to go out and not be judged based on their physical looks. It's because of the the the, the culture of fashion, mostly coming from the West, on satellite and magazines and internet now, that women, especially in Muslim countries now. Are being are, are being are feeling the pressure to uh, change their appearance. I mean, for example, in Lebanon, which is a very westernized country, you're seeing plastic surgery going out of control, basically. 
Why do women have to feel the need to actually butcher themselves or mutilate themselves to be accepted in society? I think that's horrific and I blame the social pressure and the conditions which are uh, making women feel inadequate unless they, they do these, these, these procedures. So, thank you. So, it's the hijab is meant to be actually be a liberation for women. That it tells the woman, you will be accepted and respected and listened to irregardless of what you look like. And that's the purpose of the hijab. And also at the same time, it's, it's also, um, it also can to, to, to reassure a woman that when her husband leaves every day for work, that he won't be looking at every woman or it will, it will help him, it will help him to lower his gaze. Obviously a man has to lower his gaze anyway, irrespective. But um, what the Quran says in Surah Nisai is that humans are weak, right? The Quran doesn't expect humans to be perfect. That's the, the great thing about Islam is it's so merciful, it understands humans are weak. It doesn't expect us to be angels. <laughs> That we're, we're gonna, we are gonna sin. We are going to fall down. So, in light of this, it tries to make it easy for us. Let's not tempt each other. Let's not co um, compete with each other, uh, and let's not um, try to outdo each, outdo each other, or to tempt each other's spouses away from uh, from uh, themselves. And I've seen many. I've seen. I've seen funny couples um, uh, uh, well, out and about. There's a man be sitting down with his girlfriend or wife, uh, drinking coffee. Uh, a woman with uh, a miniskirt walk, walks by and the man just like his, his, his gaze tra trails and, and, uh, and his girlfriend or wife just, you know, says, hey, I'm over here or slaps him or whatever, right? Now, you see, and you know what, does she feel nice? Does she feel okay when to see her boyfriend stroke spouse do that? No, I don't think so. I don't think she, feel, does she feel secure when she sees that being done? No. And even if she doesn't, even if he doesn't do it in front of her, does she feel secure knowing that there are women that look better than her? Of which, of which can tempt her spouse away, you know, she doesn't feel secure. Even if you trust your spouse, most people don't feel secure. And vice versa, not just for women, but also for men. So Islam tries to remove the whole uh, uh, sexual politics and tensions and issues from society because it, it doesn't benefit society. It doesn't rationally, it doesn't benefit society at all. So let's go out in society and, and do what we're meant to do, which is being professional or educational, learning or helping each other, or doing charity, or doing a whole number of beneficial things without having this uh, kind of, you know, sexual politics in society. This is the, the, uh, the wisdom that Islam tries to um, give. Someone says, asks an interesting question, why are there no female prophets? This was a very interesting discussion. I uh, reminded me of a discussion of, um, of scholars in El Andalus, where I'm from, Portugal, also and Spain included. In history, during Islamic times, there was actually a discussion as to were there any um, female prophets? Some people actually posited that Miriam, Mary, the mother of Jesus, that she was a prophet because she was given a message by an angel and this would be, this would be the, the minimum requirement to be called a, a, prof a prophetess rather. So some people have debated this matter and they said maybe Mary was a prophetess but that's, but in Islam we don't really, we don't really, um, we don't really care the packaging of the message. We care about the message itself. So it's, it's irrelevant whether the message was delivered by a male or a female, as long as the message was delivered, we don't, we don't worship the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, we worship the originator of the message he conveyed. So it's irrelevant really who, who actually delivers the message. We're not messenger-centric like other religions might, might are. We, we, we worship only, only God. Someone made a quote, one man equals to two women. Is this an Islamic principle? It's not an Islamic principle, but by dint of so many narrations which are contradicted. In fact, one could argue that a mother is, is, is worth three fathers, <laughs> if you want, according to some narration, if you want to look at it like this. This was taken from perhaps a misunderstanding of a verse of the Quran which talked about uh, witnessing financial contracts. There was a, basically, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, women didn't get involved so much in finance or, or, uh, or and that, and merchant, being a merchant and, and business. So they really weren't involved in finance. So the, uh, uh, the Quran almost gave a, uh, a, dis a help to women for those who are, are involved in, in observing financial transactions. And really what it is, is if you're going to write a contract or a, of a financial transaction of some kind, or, or, or a promised financial transaction, that you can have, um, you know, two male witnesses, or you can have, you know, instead of one male witness, you can have two female witnesses. And then it explained in the Quran why two female witnesses. Because if there's any dispute about this contract and someone, you have to recall your witnesses, it says that the, the, the woman 
can give her testimony and the, her, her colleague can remind her if she makes a mistake. So it's not saying that women's memory is deficient because many of the people who narrated um, the, uh, the traditions of the prophets, so, so, um, uh, so many people who actually uh, transmitted, memorized traditions or sayings of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, were women. And no one said in Islamic scholarship that just because a woman like Aisha who, tran who transmitted 40% of Sunni narrations, 40% of all Sunni discourse uh, uh, on the Prophet Muhammad was narrated by a woman. No one says that the, these narrations are, are not as trustworthy because a w it, it was based on a woman's memory. No one says that. So really then, all that, the only way you can really explain it is how the Quran explains it. Which is really, it's, uh, if anything, it's positive discrimination or, or actually it helps. So if a woman's in the court and she, she just feels intimidated, she'll just have a colleague with her. And the colleague's job is only to remind her if she makes a mistake. That's what the Quran says. That's what the Quran says. Read it for yourself. So, so like, if she, um, so, the, so, so that the other one will remind her if she makes a mistake. It doesn't, doesn't say so they both will give testimony. It didn't say that. It says so that one will remind her if she makes a mistake. So uh, there is no such thing as one man equals two women. Um, one other misconception people will say is that because um, in cases of murder, if if someone is murdered, if a man is murdered, uh, and or it's man or due to manslaughter, so it's, it's, it's or accidental uh, murder, that the, the the financial compensation to the family is uh, double that of the, the the woman, or that the man's inheritance. Uh, is doubled out of his of his uh, sister, and they say, is this also meaning that men are equal to two women? No, it's just because, uh, and this is very self-evident, um, men are obligated to look after women. So the extra portion of inheritance he gets will have to go on a woman, <laughs> will have to be spent on his wife or his sisters or daughters or so. It will have to be spent on women, basically. A man is obligated. Uh, to spend on on uh, on uh, on, uh, on his wife, a wife is not obligated to spend on uh, the man. Um, with, with regards to if a man is killed in the family, that's a, that's a form of, uh, uh, that's you're eliminating their form of financial support in that family, and so the financial uh, the financial redress has to be double because it's assumed the man will have to be providing for the family. You see, Be why? Because it's an obligation on the man to provide for the family. Now, now, really, the only argument anyone could say of anything which is not equal is that you could say it's not fair that men have to provide for women. Why do men have to give women a dowry for marriage? That's not fair. I don't want to give women dowry. I don't want to look after them or pay for them. And so, and that would be a men's rights activist in the audience, perhaps, who might raise that. But um, uh, that would be the only argument they could they could level. But um, men and women are equal in the eyes of God. There is no different valuations. The, this is only related to financial matters due to uh, the fact that men and women have um, uh, different, uh, different obligations. Someone wrote, head, cov head cover is himal in Arabic. Yeah, okay, I said that. <laughs> all you told, or all you said, uh, was very nice, but do you really believe that nowadays the, the womans are so well treated? Do you do really man's put all that you said into practice? Okay. Is it in practice? Uh, no, uh, mostly not in the, in the Muslim world. Why is that? Well, if you look at the Muslim world, these, are the, these regimes, these nations, are mostly the product of colonialism. And the problem with colonialism was it infused in Muslims um, very Victorian ideas of men and women conduct. So the idea that women should stay at home or their, their place is in the home or their, their, their women shouldn't, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't work, go out to work, is a very Victorian English idea, uh, or even a French idea, which was imparted into the Muslim world. It's not actually um, indigenous to, to, to our worldview. When the British um, took over Egypt, they stopped women who were, who were studying to become medical practitioners. They stopped that happening. They said that women shouldn't, shouldn't bother with uh, being doctors. Men should be doctors. Women uh, don't have to worry about that. The British did that, and they, and they did, did that as part of civilizing the natives. <laughs> so they civilized us by removing women's rights from that was practiced by Islam. Um, the, the Muslim world is a product of what happened to us in history. And you know, uh, as Muslims, uh, what we are trying to do is we're trying to actually revive Islam in the, in the Middle East. 
revive Islam in the Muslim world. And, what, and all, the in, all the injustices you see in the Muslim world, some people say um, the, there's injustice against women and it's due to patriarchy, this uh, conspiracy theory about this, uh, or men ruling the world and so on and so forth. Um, well, the thing is this, in the Middle East, everyone's oppressed, right? The poor, the, the middle class, those who actually even speak, speak about Islam are oppressed. Everyone's oppressed apart from uh, you know, various ruling elites. And do you think putting a woman will change the, the dynamic? Look at, ba look at Bangladesh. There are two, the, the government alter alternates between two female rulers and yet there's torture and there's killing and there's suppression of political dissent in Bangladesh. So that's why I'm saying equality doesn't, equality doesn't necessitate justice. It's just, you, so all you're really going to call for is saying, well, we believe that women should have an equal right to be dictators as much as men. <laughs> you know, is that going to bring justice? No. Right? So um, the problem in the Middle East is that Muslims aren't living by Islam. Uh, we're mostly illiterate about our own religion or belief system. Belief system. Um, when even discussing uh, the Sharia, when I do many lectures on the Sharia, Muslims actually are, are as shocked about it as non-Muslims are, just coming into, into lecture. And what I've said is not really controversial or new or fresh, really old. it's actually old, basically. So, um, and what's interesting was, um, in the, in the time of the 18th century, uh, a few uh, you know people from Britain could could travel around the world, and many many well-to-do women travelled to Ottoman areas, Ottoman Turkey, and what they were absolutely shocked when they were writing about, they were absolutely shocked. They were shocked to see that women were business owners, and they were patrons of hospitals and uh, institutions of learning, and they even remarked that they've never seen any place in the world where women ha are as happy or have as much rights as in. Ottoman Turkey, Ottoman Caliphate, <laughs> right? The Ottoman Caliphate. So this was in the 18th century. It wasn't that too long ago. So Islam gave, uh, uh, you know, gave women rights, and under its traditional Islamic beliefs, women uh, were uh, given justice. But now, in secular regimes like Egypt, uh, obviously Iraq, or under Saddam Hussein, uh, Syria, Bashar Assad, Algeria. I'd even, I'd even say Saudi Arabia is also a secular regime, a, 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 a monarchy, constitutional monarchy. It's not, that's not a, a, an Islamic system. Um, under these un-Islamic secular regimes, you're seeing oppression of women. You're seeing oppression of minorities. The Christians are being oppressed. I would, I would, I would think that they are being oppressed. The, you know, the Yazidis got, got kicked out. The uh, Christians were, uh, have been kicked out many places after colonialism after secularism you saw, you saw people fighting each other even in other places where it's not predominantly Muslim like India Hindus and Muslims live side by, and Christians uh, who, are, who are those who are converted live side by side for centuries after colonialism there's now the rise of fascist groups and of marginalization of minorities and oppression and many problems in secular uh, uh, the democratic India so um, colonialism didn't really do any favors for the Muslim world and I would argue that what Muslims follow now is a post-colonialized, uh, uh, Victorian-influenced uh, understanding of their culture. And they're completely illiterate as to what Islam says, and they certainly don't follow it. And the problem is getting them to actually follow it and to re intellectually revive and rediscover uh, their religion. Question, if you want to. Uh, why two women witnesses? I think I mentioned that. Why do women get less inheritance compared to men? Okay, I think I, I mentioned that. Um, you said that differences in Sharia pertaining to men and women are restricted to the private sphere, but there are rulings against women becoming Qadis. Well, tell that to Khalif Omar. Um, or, or becoming soldiers. Uh, no, women can join the army. Women join the army at the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Do you say that this is not a valid ruling? If it is a valid ruling, then don't the differences extend to the public sphere too? The, I mean, the, 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 the obligation of, of, that, of men to join, to be in the army or be reservists is certainly something beyond the, the private sphere, yes. But women aren't restricted from joining the army. Women can join uh, the army. And at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, we have narrations where a woman goes to the Prophet and asks him to join uh, the fighting forces. And uh, she is allowed uh, to do so. Um, and again, women being judges at the time of, the, of, of Caliph Omar, I already, I already mentioned that, that example. So all these valid rulings, as, I mean, rulings, I wouldn't, I mean, I don't, are you saying that rulings from modern, some, some modern day scholars? I, I would really um, take some, some of what I've heard from modern day um, scholars uh, with a pinch of salt. 
and, and pepper. Why, um, you know, classical scholars have a much better understanding. Uh, why can women not be leaders in Islam of a country and nation? Okay, this, this is an interesting question. So why can't women not be leaders? You mean, what you mean is you mean the caliph, basically. Why can't women be the caliph of the of, um, uh, Muslim society? Well, there's a, there's, there's a very basic reason for this. The caliph is not, the position is not a right. Like, no one has a right to be the caliph. No one has, it's not, it's not a, 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 a privileged position anyway. Um, there's no perks in it. There's no extra money in it. Uh, in fact, you're, you're accounted for what you do as the, as the leader. Uh, you'll be accounted by the subjects for what you do. There is no perks you get with it, with being the, the caliph. You can't decide what the law is because the law is set out in the Sharia. And if you, um, you have to consult scholars, uh, of which some of those scholars can be women, of course, who will... Uh, say what the strongest opinion is and the leader just has to execute the rules he doesn't have a choice to say I'm gonna as a male I'm gonna ben I'm gonna make laws to benefit the male population no you can't do that in Islam because it's, we don't we don't uh, segregate the, the population into male and female in that sense uh, to make them interest groups that have to be uh, that can have uh, equal access to the same uh, power structure we don't have that sexist uh, dynamic in our society so then uh, if the caliph is not right I mean, you can't Put yourself up to be the caliph, right? Any, I mean, the, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, anyone who um, who asks for power, you know, you know, shouldn't shouldn't get it or doesn't deserve it, depending on how you translate it. So a, a person cannot ask to be a leader. You can't ask people to vote for you in Islam. The leader is really just uh, the extension or the extrapolation of the military duty. The whole point of the caliph, that actually his point of the caliph is to be the commander in chief of the military forces, of which men are obliged to be uh, reservists. The caliph is chosen by a council, by the people and so on, to undertake, uh, to undertake that role. Now, it, 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 in that sense, it's not a privilege to undertake that role. It's not a right that belongs to anyone. In fact, it's actually an imposed role. People were, were made caliphs against their will. They didn't want to be the caliph. You had, no, you must be the caliph. And this is, this is the situation. So. In Islam, really, it's just that the caliph is really an extrapolation of the military obligation of men uh, to be the protectors of society. That's, all it, that's really what it is. I suppose, in one way, it, it's kind of commensurate to the Roman idea of the magister, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the magister which was a, a person selected in times of conflict to be the head, the, the, the military chief, uh, commander-in-chief, and who would basically defend. And we see the Prophet Muhammad described the caliph as um, the, the shield of the, of, the, of the people behind which the people fight and protect themselves. So the caliph role is really an extrapolation of the military role and the military role is an obligation upon uh, men and hence because being an obligation upon men uh, a man is selected usually against his will, not, he couldn't ask for it, uh, to be the leader and he must discharge the obligations uh, of, of, that, of that position. Now because you can't ask, uh, because it's an obligation upon men, it's viewed as a burden not as a privilege um, the one, someone might ask, well, okay, but why can't a woman ask to be considered to be um, the leader and the, uh, and the problem, or the caliph rather, and the problem with that was, is that you immediately disqualify yourself by asking to get power in the first place. Because you, you, don't, you don't ask to get the, become the caliph, you get selected to be, the, to be the caliph, and usually under great protest, because there's no, there's no perks in it, it's, it's, it's one of the greatest burdens. Um, and uh, depending on, obviously, um, uh, I suppose how you might view it, you could also view it as, I mean, like, what right do we have to, bur to uh, impose the burden of becoming the supreme military leader, which must go to war uh, to uh, women against their will, you know, when it's not an obligation for women to be part of the army. Whereas because all men are reservists, uh, they are the pool of which you, you can select a, an appropriate candidate uh, from, um, uh, and they can't select themselves. So it's actually a burden role, not a privilege role. Power is not a privilege in Islam. It's not a right. It's a burden, and uh, you'll, you'll be given it uh, probably against your will uh, because you, you won't really covet it. And the leader has to give justice to all people, not just to their interest group or their racial group or their national group or their gender group. And that kind of gender politics has called, oh, sorry, um, identity politics has caused the problems in the Middle East where you'll see different uh, tribes or sects or races fighting each other 
for a, a, a stake in, in, the, in power and deciding what, you know, what happens in power. Whereas in Islam, the, lead, the caliph doesn't, is not the sovereign, he's not the king, he's only the executor. He has no choice in what laws to make, he's only there to, to discharge the duty um, and, uh, and even put their, his life on the line uh, in, uh, to defend the Muslim community. So uh, that's, that's, the, that's the issue. It's not that it's differential rights because there is no right to be the caliph in Islam or, or to, to it's, it's certainly not a privilege. Uh, what rights do women have in terms of housework and taking care of the family or the husband? So what rights do, do women have? Well, I mean, there's no, act, there's no actually express obligation in Islam to say that the, the woman must look after the house, clean the house and, and, and mend the clothing. We actually know that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, himself mended his own clothes and helped his wives cleaning the house. So there's no real, there's no obligation in of itself that says women thou shalt clean the house <laughs> or um, iron the shirts, right? You won't, you won't find that um, in Islam. But, but what the, 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 the rights that the, that the husband has uh, with regards to uh, the woman, and I, I mentioned today already the rights the woman has over her husband. So there's also commensurate rights on the side. In that sense, the, the man um, has the right to, to be obviously respected by his wife and to be uh, and to have um, responsibility and obviously she should uh, facilitate or grant um, his reasonable requ requests and one of the rights she has is that she can't be overburdened by her husband's requests so if the husband makes requests more than uh, she can facilitate uh, then she can ask for for example a housemaid and she has to provide it a housemaid and so so um, any one of you who are is any, more, oh, okay. and so any 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 one of you who are um, budding husbands uh, don't make too much requests from your wife, otherwise you're going to have to pay for uh, a housemaid. So, yeah, you, and of course, the, the, other, the other rights are, of course, that uh, the woman must have, uh, must be provided... Okay, so I will. So the woman must be provided with, uh, with the same quality of clothing, not, not necessarily the same clothing as her husband, and, and eat from the same, and have the same kind of quality of food. So basically the husband can't say, I'm, a, I, I'm obliged to provide for you food, here's some gruel, and I'll have a nice roast, roast beef dinner. No, she has to, obviously, she has a right uh, to share equally with what he has and what, what, and what he enjoys, enjoys from his own property. Um, I'll, take, I'll take a question uh, from the audience now, because I think I've read most of the papers here. So, any questions, comments, or criticisms, or what people wanting to come back on what anything I've said, uh, you sister at the back. Um, you mentioned earlier that women obviously are allowed to work. Yeah. Okay, so um, you've, you've read that women aren't allowed to travel without a male guardian. It's usually um, a long distance, so you know, like traveling halfway around the world, unescorted or alone, and it's just more for issues of protection rather than that uh, the, the, the chaperone is going to make sure that she's not doesn't do infidelity or anything. It's not that. It's not that. It's not the reason. The reason is just to ensure that she's secure uh, by some by some means. Not. I mean, uh, people have discussed obviously modern transport such as planes and trains, which will get you to long distances in, in very quick you know, time and in essence as long as a woman is protected or made, uh, her security is guaranteed that's really what the purpose is is to ensure that her security is guaranteed, guaranteed wherever she, she goes you hear these you hear obviously stories of unaccompanied women who go halfway across the world and have an experience really you know bad things happen to them and it's just we just we just uh, you know uh, Islam doesn't want to see that happen obviously to, to women so women's security is, is paramount and it just has to be guaranteed so that she's not uh, molested or uh, some, something, God forbid, um, nasty happens to her when she goes halfway across the world by herself to a place where she's not familiar with or, or, or so on. So it's, it's nothing, to do with, nothing to do with the inferiority of women. In fact, it's because we, women are valued that the security is considered to be more paramount than even than male security. So women's, women, uh, women's security is more important than, than even man's security. Man, you take care of yourself. Uh, you're, you know, but for a woman, we have to guarantee that she's, she's safe and secure uh, to, to uh, travel and and so on. And she could be traveling for business or traveling for whatever purposes she travels for, but it's just to main, maintain her security or sure that she's okay. Uh, you, madam. Um, from what you were telling us, um, it, seemed, it sounded like the Quran is very gender considerate, right? But then you just admitted before that uh, there is actually a mismatch with what is saying and what is actually happening yeah. in many countries. So my question would be, what did you suggest that that could be changed to diminish that gap among other things? Because that's also causing a lot of strong, um, 
not racism, but like stereotype prejudice against Muslim people, even in Western societies, that regardless of the gender, there is this mental image that is extremely diminishing or that goes against with this um, information that you just gave us about the Quran. Okay. Well, um, the, well, some of the problems are, thank you. Some of the problems that we, we, we see, uh, again, are due to, I mean, okay, to, to say uh, it, it's cultural, the question is obviously where did that culture come from? And it, and it either came from pre-Islamic culture or from um, post-colonial culture, which was mostly borrowed from, um, uh, uh, well, at the time of colonization was mostly the Victorian culture and understanding. And if anyone who studies Victorian understanding of, uh, of men and women's relations will know that a lot of what the Muslims do are very familiar with what the Victorians did. Because the Muslims looked up to the Victorians as the colonists as the superior moral power and they emulated what the Victorians because so, so the women's so women under the, the Victorian times were considered to be fragile, weak and must be looked after because this and and even considered not I mean they couldn't own property and and the man had full control over over the wife. So the Muslims looked up to this superior colonizing power and just emulated uh, the, what they observed. So unfortunately the problems, a lot of the problems in the Muslim world are due to us emulating Europeans a uh, hundred years ago. Um, um, can you make a final question, please? Final question, okay. So how to deal with it? Well, you know, pe when people think of, let's say, Sharia, they think, oh, women's education stops. On the Sharia, women's education stops. But, uh, and they cite, for example, the Afghan Taliban, or they cite um, a, a, a section of the, the Pakistani Taliban, uh, which was um, uh, which was in the area where uh, Malala was infamously uh, uh, shot. So, and they say, look at these people; they stop women's education, right? But now, the thing is this: this they don't pay attention to the other, the many thousands and thousands of other Islamic movements, which e which have women in their movements um, who are political spokesmen. Um, even in uh, in, uh, in in Pakistan, um, we saw that uh, in, in in the cities, one of the re many religious movements have. Schools where they teach men and women Islamic studies, for example, uh, we see that in many of the groups that arose under the Arabic Spring, that women were uh, were you know politicians under Islamic movements or groups that professed to want Islam. Uh, so people ignore those things. You know, it's like it's called confirmation bias. We only look at the things which reinforce a particular prejudice we already have, and we just ignore, gloss over the contradictory uh, things which would which would actually challenge someone who was more objective or not um, uh, kind of uh, intellectually compartmentalized. So uh, as Muslims, the, the strive to change the Muslim world and revive Islam um, is, is, is one of a political one, of political movements, of, as a social movement. But unfortunately, it's not an unimpeded movement. We're, we're facing resistance from uh, these secular dictators that don't want things to change and they're, they're quite happy with the power structure as it is which mo mostly favors them and of course those who are their backers behind them who give them the weapons the f support um, and uh, 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 have a degree of interference in our in our internal affairs which is uh, united states and uh, uk and so on who support these regimes and then they decry any movements which want to revive islam they call them pejoratively islamists or islamism or extremism, or what have you, uh, to uh, denounce them, even though these mo these movements are, are demonstrably much more fair. I'll just give you an example, right? So, um, Mohammed al Morsi, Mohammed al Morsi in Egypt, um, he didn't he didn't have any, have any power. Some could say he was set up. Uh, obviously, uh, even under even on his presidency, the police wouldn't obey him. No one would obey. He didn't have any any real power though. But one of the things he tried to do, or he tried to say, was. Um, people could insult him and, and, and criticize him or say bad things against him and he never called for people to be arrested or to be tortured or, or so on and so forth. There was this uh, program by um, Bassem Yusuf called Benamig, which is, Arab, which is Egyptian Arabic for program, the program, um, uh, modeling over John Stewart. He used, to, he used to mock, he used to completely mock, you know, Mohammed al Morsi, right? So uh, I used to mock him and, and so on. And then after Mohammed al Morsi got kicked out of power by Sisi, who protected Egypt from this, the Islamists. Um, Bernamek was shot down, even though the guy is, 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 is more of a liberal and liberal bent, or secular liberal bent, uh, 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 Bassem Yusuf. It was shot down, uh, banned, uh, people, uh, anyone criticizing Sisi or saying anything about, about him is immediately incarcerated, locked up. Some of them are accused of being terrorists and su subject to summary or subject to execution. <laughs> you see, now this is under secular Sisi compared to uh, a bit more Islamic Morsi, you'll see the difference. And yet Morsi is portrayed as 
the evil Islamist, and, sec and Sisi is portrayed as the hero secularist. You, you see, and this is the problem that we are, we uh, our confirmation bias is that we will ignore the examples which disprove uh, what we're being told uh, in the media or the stereotypes, and we will only listen to the examples which reinforce those stereotypes. I mean, I'm no fan of Saudi Arabia, I'm one of their strongest critics, right? But there was a case in Saudi Arabia, and we, we all know of the quirky court cases that come out of Saudi Arabia. But there was a court case where a woman came, came to a court and said, my husband's abusing me, he's beating me up. And so the court judged that the husband will be sentenced to 30 lashes for uh, domestic abuse against his wife. Was that covered in the news? Pin drop silence. Why? It doesn't reinforce the stereotype, which is, which is common. So, um, as to how we can change um, the perception of Islam, I, I think that is to, we, we, we have to buy out um, Rupert Murdoch. But as to, as to how we can change the Middle East, it's up to all of us to become, uh, to be reacquainted with Islam, become literate with both Islam's political philosophy, its theology, its, its legal theory, and, and strive to be advocates for this in our, in, our, in our countries, despite the fact that obviously we face real threats from the government and more threats from those who back the government uh, abroad we, it, it is our, our issue and at the end of the day although we, we may blame uh, United States we blame dictators ultimately the soldiers and the police who enforce the current status quo all come from our society they come from our, us and we have to be giving down we have to call down means calling to inviting them to Islam you know, because these dictators wouldn't be able to do what they did or do without soldiers willing to obey their, their orders or believing they are legitimate authorities. So as Muslims, and I point to the Muslims here, it's your responsibility to uh, go and, uh, and, and spread the, the understanding of Islam and invite the soldiers, the police, and all those who have power to Islam. And then naturally, then the leader will be, uh, uh, will be accounted. Some leaders might even change their mind because everyone around them is changing their mind and they will be brought uh, uh, back to Islam and they, we can establish justice in the Muslim world and be a good example uh, like we were in the past when Western uh, journalists or Western writers would go in the 18th century to the Muslim world and be so amazed about how uh, liberated women were and how much justice there was for women and they were shocked and they said there is nowhere else in this, on this earth that they, the, the women are as happy or as free as they are in, in, under the Ottoman Caliphate you wouldn't even think anyone would say that now. So it's time for us to uh, rediscover Islam, advocate it, and change our own situation because it's not going to change itself. Okay, that's it. Sorry to finish, so we were a bit tired of time.